So good evening, welcome along. In conservation with is what you've joined. I'm David Lindo, also known as the Urban Birder. Today, I have um, an old friend, really, Matt, because we've known each other for some years. Um, Matt Merritt, who's the uh, editor of Birdwatching magazine, the, the biggest selling wild bird magazine in the world, let alone the UK. Am I right in saying that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> And um, Matt and I, as I said, we go back, I can't remember when I first met you actually, Matt. Um, how long have you been working for the magazine? I've been there 14 years almost now. And I think you, you started writing for Birdwatching within probably two or three months of me starting, I think. So. 14 years. Um, yeah, because um, I've been writing, in fact, my first ever article for Birdwatching magazine was actually back in 2000 and um, maybe 2009, actually, because I, maybe even before then. Yeah, I think it was before then. I think it was yeah. not that long after I started. Yeah, because I wrote a piece, a two-part piece, a two-part piece on where to watch birds in London. Yeah, yeah. Guide to birds birding in London. Yeah. yeah. And when I actually started under my guise of the urban birder, the first piece I actually wrote was um, about di about diversity, lack of diversity. Yeah. Um, and the, the 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 piece was called Black and White. I remember that. So that was one. But that was the very first time I was commissioned to write anything for you. And I, was, I remember I can tell you now, Matt, because I'm now probably now firmly under the mat in terms of uh, or under the table, even in terms of uh, being writing, being a writer for the, for the for the magazine. But on that particular occasion, I was really scared. I was thinking, oh, God, you know, they've asked me to write an article, and then someone suggested I get a ghostwriter, and I said, No, 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 it's not <laughs> my voice, but. I think the old habit started from there, which is I left it to the very last minute, in fact, beyond the last minute. And I wrote the piece and I handed it in and I actually thought that uh, you'd hate it, you guys would hate it, but you liked it. And then the then yeah. uh, asked me to, to become a regular columnist and that's where it is from now. So welcome along everyone, all latecomers. Please uh, put yourself on mute. Um, and just to remind you, this um, conversation will go on for about an hour, and then I will officially say goodbye to Matt and you, and thank you all. But then we will have a after-show party where you can ask the questions that have been burning on your chest the whole hour, and you are too shy to ask, and you can actually ask it during the, the last part. So Matt, um, you're the editor of Birdwatching magazine, but obviously you weren't born the editor of Birdwatching magazine. Can you yeah. kind of give, give us a quick, sort of guided tour of your life. This is your life. Okay, um, so I, I started bird watching when I was uh, mm, seven or eight, I think. Because um, uh, I, I can remember doing a project at school and doing a, a picture of an osprey. And at the time, it, it was one of those birds I thought, I'm never gonna see this bird you know the, 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 you know about the ospreys at a lot of garden but i don't know how many pairs that have been in scotland then but not that many um and it it just really grabbed my attention and i, I started um you know i got my parents to take me out um i had an old pair of big 12 by 50 binoculars that my granddad had given me and um so i just, just try and get my parents to take me out and, and watching whatever birds were around and that um there was a kestrel, I remember, just up the lane from our house, and, and I used to go and watch that a lot. So that's what got me into birding. And, and I think like a lot of people, I, I sort of drifted away from it a bit when I was um, sort of 17, 18. And uh, um, for probably 10 or 11 years, I, I, you know, I'd still notice birds and I was still the sort of bit, bit of casual bird watching. But... Um, and um, I started working as a, a newspaper journalist and um, I had various jobs in newspapers and, and I was working in Cardiff um, in the, the late 90s. And uh, I got a, a, a back condition, ankylosing spondylitis, where you, it, it's, it's basically a kind of rheumatoid, rheumatoid arthritis. And, and the doctor said, well, to be honest, the, the best thing you can do is just get plenty of exercise and, and get out walking and um so i was walking miles every day to try and help this and at, at some stage i must have just thought you know what i should take some binoculars out and um and it was like flicking a switch it it, it sort of all came back to me and i thought why haven't i been doing this for the last 10 years or whatever so 
Um, and then from there, really, my, my main interest in bird watching just sort of, you know, blossomed, and uh, um, various other jobs in journalism. And, and as we were talking about earlier, really, um, I, I saw a, an advert in the Press Gazette um, for a features editor at, at Bird Watching Magazine, and I, I sort of ummed and ahed about it at the time because because it was, it was quite a long commute to work and everything but I thought I'd never forgive myself if I didn't give it a go really and um, so I applied for that and got it and um, uh, I was there kind of six years um, and then became acting editor and, and then eventually editor. So. Okay, um, acting editor, does that, is that a person that acts like an editor? <laughs> Pretty much, yeah, yeah. I mean, you, you, you'll remember Sheena, our, our old Sheena, editor. Yeah, Sheena Harvey. Sheena yeah. Harvey. And um, Sheena stayed within the company and they wanted her to launch this new magazine, Landscape. Oh, yeah. And um, it, it was sort of the pet project of the company. So that's why they wanted Sheena in charge. And so she went to do that. I was acting editor while she was gone. and and basically they, they, they didn't want to let her come back so Sheena eventually moved on to other things and, and BBC Wildlife and stuff but, yeah. um so yeah. I get worked out quite nicely for me but um yeah. because Birdwatching magazine used to be owned by a company called Eastern Midlands Associated but, Press yeah 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 so it used, to, it used to be very British now it's uh Bauer Media which are, which are German it is, yeah are, are German um just spanning back a bit in terms of your spark moment with ospreys and kestrels, yeah. where were you actually growing up? Um, so I grew up in a place called Colville in Leicestershire, um, and it's uh, an old mining town. It's it's um, it's not a big town. Uh, it's sort of about ten miles from Leicester itself, um, but it's at, it's on the edge of Charmwood Forest, which is you know a bit of a, an undiscovered gem I, I, i'm biased obviously but it's um there's a lot of sort of upland heath a lot of gra granite outcrops and the, uh, geologists say it's like a mini dartmoor or whatever you know it's um and it's just a sort of triangular land probably probably about eight miles on each side between leicester and Loughborough and colville um and the more i thought about it the more i thought i was really lucky there because it it, it it, it gets some birds that you you don't generally get in the, the Midlands. You know, there's large parts of the Midlands can be pretty pretty dull and predictable bird-wise. But, um, you know, we had things um, breeding curlew and um, tree pipits and, and night jars used to be fairly, um, fairly easy to find most years. And at that time as well, pied flycatcher and wool warbler. Um, were easy enough to find and, and and the more I thought about it the more I thought I was pretty lucky really because it, it, it's um that there was always something something new and you know it, it, that really helped spark my interest I suppose. So. Yeah it looks like there's, there's a catch one of getting on the act there. There is yeah yeah. <laughs> but basically yeah. That's, that area sounded like an island it was like a little sort of lost island wasn't it? Yeah yeah it is a bit um because as I say you 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 know, the mid Midlands, you, you can't get far from, especially the uh, the East Midlands, you, you're sort of stuck between Leicester and Nottingham and Derby and uh, a lot of big built up areas. Um, and and I suppose in the rest of Leicestershire, that the, all the main birding is all along the river through the centre of the county, the gravel pits and that, whereas uh, Chamber Forest, it, 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 it's a little sort of world of its own almost, you know, and um, it kind of always used to surprise me that a lot of Leicestershire birders didn't didn't bother to visit, you know, people from the city, they, they, they never seem to come out our way. But... Well, fair enough. Well, it's not fair enough, actually. Cause I understand, <laughs> when I say fair enough, I can understand because a lot of people um, don't have, uh, well, I'm not damning the whole world of birders, don't get me wrong, but some people don't, they seem to go for glamour or or don't yeah. sort of try and work in places where they don't haven't heard of before, you know? It's so yeah, yeah. to get people out. 
Now you've you've written a couple of books, one of which was uh, a sky full of birds. Yeah, I've written them one, written another one recently, which I didn't know about actually. Um, when was the that? Avery. The eighth. The what? Sorry, the Avery. It's called the Avery. Yeah. When, yeah. Is that, when was that published? Um, that came out a couple of years ago. Now. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, and it's it's kind of a, an art book really. So I just wrote the species accounts for it. Um, but it's one of a little series. You can sort of pop the pop the art out. It's aimed at kids mainly, and uh, there's a little series. That, that, there's a butterfly one that James Lowen did, and I think there's a trees, wildflowers, might be one other as well. Yeah, but, um, but that was an sorry, I, I was just going to say it was an interesting one because it was it was sort of worldwide birds. So you know there was some very familiar stuff to write about, and that, there was some some stuff that I. I had to go and do a lot of research for really because you know stuff I've never heard of really so um tell us about a sky full of birds what was that yeah like? um it was it was really that I, I I've been very lucky um in my job you know that you, you get to you get to travel all over Britain um and you get to travel a bit abroad as well and and um you go to you know some of these iconic locations um in Europe and further afield in a place like extra Madura, you know, and, and see huge gatherings of cranes, say, or, um, you know, in South America, been to cock of the rock leks and that kind of thing. And I wanted to do a book, um, really bringing together some of the, the great bird spectacles of Britain and, and, and hopefully getting over to people that for the most of them, you don't need to sort of go off into the back of beyond or, um, you know, uh, they're really not difficult to see, you know, they're, they're on your doorstep almost. So um, that that was the the idea behind it. And um, as I started writing it, 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 I suppose it became a bit more autobiographical and, and um, uh, things like how I got into bird watching came into it. Um, uh, but, you know, I, well, I guess you know what it's like writing a book that it doesn't always go the way you expected it to at the start. It, it sort of takes you down different paths. And um, when did you realise, and this is a question I always ask people of Britain books, when did you realise that you could write and wanted to write? Um, I'd, I'm not sure really. I, 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 I always enjoyed writing at school, but uh, I've... Um, you know, at university, I sort of ummed and ahed about what I wanted to do for a career, and I, 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 I kind of left university without any idea. And um, what did you study at university? I studied history, so um, yeah, nothing to do with birds at all, really. But um, I, I was doing a sort of what was supposed to be a temporary job at, at H. Samuel, and and uh, Is that uh, they. They actually offered me the, to train as a jeweller, and I think I'd have been terrible at it. Um, and and just about that time, I used to write football and cricket reports for the local paper. And um, a job came up there, and and the the sports editor said, "Oh, I'll apply for it. You know, you could do that." And uh, I did, and it just went from there, really. So, um, and then when you're writing every day f for a living, uh, I suppose you've got to like it, and you you've got to get better at it. So, um, it's interesting because we'll get onto magazines in a minute, but I'm sure there's many people here that may not understand or realise what goes into uh, the magazine and how it works and what the, the environment's like. I mean, I used to mm. work in magazines myself. My, my previous job before being a personal, direct, personal assistant to a, a film director and also before being the Urban Birder was in sales and marketing. So I was actually on the other side selling advertising space for various publications and you get yeah. to learn of how these things are put mm -hmm. together and how in reality a magazine cannot exist without advertising you know because no. it's all very well no. having all these lovely color pages and you know and lots of people writing but you need to pay for it and you have to yeah, yeah. With advertising and it's, it's it's really it's really quite fascinating because people i think um i mean let's talk about what you do as we're on the subject you know, I, I'd imagine that people may imagine that you're sitting there and sort of saying, right, you go to Bolivia and <laughs> or you come back in two weeks time with an article on blah, blah, blah. And, you know, what is it like really? 
Um, <laughs> it's a lot more mundane than that, but um, we're, uh, we're, we're, we've got a very small staff. There's only, well, four and a half of us, really, at the magazine. Um, uh, so we've got a designer and a sub-editor, and then myself and my assistant editor, Mike Whedon. Um, and me and Mike do quite a bit of the writing. Sometimes Mike especially, he, he writes a lot of the sort of uh, nuts and bolts bits of the magazine. Um, and then a, lo a lot of the feature, um, a lot of the feature content of the magazine is is people who approach us, you know, quite speculatively. Um, uh, we, um, we have our regulars like you or, or Dominic Cousins, say, um, who, who um, you know, we commission stuff. Um, we have something definite in mind and we will commission it. But, but still an awful lot of the content comes from people who, who will, um, you know, say that they've got a story they want to tell, really. And, and um, some of them are, are academics and, and or, um, you know, people at the RSPB or BTO, but a lot of them are, are sort of ordinary bird watchers. And, um, and sometimes it is that they've just got this one story they want to tell. And, and then we've had others um, who, you know, um, having seen they can do it, that, that they come up with a lot more great ideas. And um, I think that's the most enjoyable part of the job, really, that, that we... Um, uh, sort of talking with some of the ed other editors in the company, um, I think I'm really lucky in that respect that that we we don't have to go looking for material. Um, it's the opposite, really. We get a lot of good material, and um, it's it's a question of sifting through it and 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 knowing what to use and when, I suppose. So, so that leads me on to what do you actually look for in an article? So if, if uh, someone in the uh, the Zoom audience now wants to send something to you, what what are you looking for? Um, I think I think the one thing we're always looking for is um, for there to be something of the writer in in the, the article and, and something of the experience of seeing the bird rather than just the sort of the technical aspect of it and and they're important and uh, you know we, we do some, sometimes do quite science heavy articles but even then Hopefully, we've got writers who um, who can bring to it something of the experience of seeing the bird and, and why it is that that's special to them. You know, um, I think Dominic, who I mentioned, Dominic Cousins, is a really good example of that. He, he you know, he, he he sort of sends his his feature in each every four weeks, and I read through it, and every time I think, oh, there's there's so sort of half a dozen things there I didn't know about that species, and and it's usually a very common or garden species. Um, but it's always based on Dominic's um, sort of personal experience of it as well, uh, and um, I think it's that balance, hopefully, that that um, we try and get, and that that's what our readers seem to like. So, what do you do when someone sends you something which is obviously not? I mean, it's, it's some. You know, someone sent you something that they think is amazing, but actually, it's kind of. Um, <laughs> how do you respond to that? Um, well, yeah, I suppose you just have to let them down gently. Usually, yeah. um, you know, so, so uh, you do get as well. You, you sometimes get people who have got a great story to tell, and, and all all the raw materials there, but that they can't quite get there with the writing, and and you know, you can help out then and. and sort of rewrite with them and, and that kind of thing um and that probably happens more often with photographers you know you often got photographers who have got got something that you think well we'd we'll really like to get that in the magazine but uh you know the words as they are aren't going to work so um you know you can work through that with them so yeah there's a lot of similarities i find with an editor and um, editor both in print as well as editor in film for example because you know I learned a long time ago especially when I started doing TV that when you do something and you think to yourself oh that's terrible oh, oh, oh the editor's there to then cut all your good bits to, to put it all together and make it look amazing so when you watch it back you think wow it didn't look too bad at all yeah, yeah. Um, and it's the same with I think with what you do because um 
I mean, I'm saying this because I, I write, so I, I understand. Um, sometimes people get very precious um, when they're written yeah. something and they, oh, you've changed it. I think, you know, but for me, I think to myself, well, actually, I'm giving you bones and you're just dressing it for me to make everyone look good. Yeah. And I think the first time, I mean, I, my background, I, I, I write, but I don't consider myself, well, for a long time, I didn't consider myself a writer at all. Um, so in my earlier um, pieces of work, some magazines I'd send stuff to, and then when I received it, it as a PDF or the magazine, it's been rewritten to, to fit the style of the magazine. Um, and at first, you kind of, it kind of burns you. You think, oh, I feel a fraud because I didn't write that. I didn't use that word. But then later on down the track, you find that um, actually people love it. Yeah. <laughs> and the editor doesn't take the credit or the sub-editor. It's your credit because at the end of the day, it's your idea. It's just, it's yeah. just been moulded. Yeah, definitely. Um, I think I think that's exactly it, really. That um, we want to bring out the, the personality and the experience of the writer, and for the most part, we don't want ourselves sort of intruding into it, really. Yeah, you know, um, the, 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 there is a bit. You know, Mark, Mike Whedon writes a very personal column in the the magazine. It, it's just sort of uh, very much about his obsession with birding, but um, but otherwise, we we, we tend to hopefully step back and and let the writers um get their personality over and get their experience over so. yeah that takes that takes time um actually we've got a small crowd here today i don't know if anyone's got anything to add here i just wondered how many people in the zoom uh, how many of you zoomers have actually written an article for any magazine um if uh, you can tell us about that experience uh, that'd be really interesting so uh be nice to know if, you, if you've got an experience but you know that takes as a writer that takes time to get used to and after a while you suddenly realize that actually that the editor the sub editor are actually there to help you yeah um, and it makes your work better and i remember writing a couple of things not for you actually but other magazines and it was essentially rewritten yeah but it was far better um and it kind of makes you realize that sometimes you don't have to worry so much about getting it word perfect. You know, it's more about getting the essence over. I'm not saying write in shorthand, but you write yeah. the piece out and then you, you, uh, you actually, uh, you know, send it in and, and then it's beautified. Uh, Chris here says, no, unfortunately, an accountant by profession, but you can still write interesting accounts in accounts, yeah. couldn't you? There's accountancy <laughs> magazines, aren't there, Chris? Um, yeah. but yeah, um, how, what, what keeps writers coming back to bird watching magazine? Oh, that's, that's a good question. Um, well, hopefully, I mean, uh, as you mentioned, we're, we're the biggest selling bird magazine in the UK and, and, and I think the, the biggest selling commercial one in, in the world, probably. Um, uh, so, you know, they know they're going to get, get exposure. Um, but um i hope over the years again it, it's that we we we've remained pretty open to ideas you know we, we we try not to we've got a good idea of who our readers are but we try not to um pitch everything all in one direction you know we're, we're uh, a lot of our readers are beginners or or sort of improvers as as we call them but we get we get readers who are you know real sort of top end birders i suppose as well and and so um the, hopefully there's stuff for them as well we, we try and keep an open mind about about what we what content we're going to use and and hopefully that keeps writers interested as well so. well it's 2020 we're, we're in the middle of a pandemic um the magazine industry as itself you know as an entity has been dying for on its feet for for some years now um I remember when Birdwatching magazine first came out I remember being so excited seeing the the adverts for it because there was uh, I think the picture of, a, of the tail end of a weed here just popping out of frame and saying something like it's coming. You know, yeah. I was really excited about this new magazine coming. And for a while, there were several magazines I remember because I was an avid reader of all of them. I remember there was 
bird watching and then there was twitching which turned into birding world and of course there's always british birds they were the classic ones that most people read and they seem to fit very neatly um with each other because you know bird british bird is very kind of scientific and yeah mythologists and you got twitching which obviously by the very name tells you what it does and then bird watching magazine which catered for i always felt beginners and people who wanted to sort of get into the into the hobby do you think that a magazine has changed much since the first days um in terms of who, who we're, we're aiming at probably not that much i uh, say we're, we're, we're still very much beginners and uh improvers and and i think you know when we've done surveys our readers tend to um they, they, they do quite a lot of garden bird watching uh, a bit of sort of casual bird watching and, and maybe you know some of them might go out once a month on an actual birding expedition um so they're not necessarily obsessive about it or anything like that um so in in, in that sense we're probably uh, our sort of target audience has, has remained the same but um i think some of the other mags um bird watch and, and bbc wildlife at times that they've changed their focus a bit and um you know obviously we sort of keep our eye on that but um there's there's room for there's room for more than one bird in mag really in this country you know we're, we've got such a, a large pool of bird watchers that um it's not necessarily one or the other um and, and we know that a lot of people buy both mags you know so um Obviously, we want to outsell them, but <laughs> uh, you know, uh, well, generally we we have done over the years, so yeah, we don't worry too much about that. So. Claire was asking, how do you keep the content fresh after fourteen years? So you must have regular meetings discussing the uh, contents, yeah? Yeah, yeah. Um, probably a couple of times a year, we go out on a, a bit of a a day out um, to rub the water or somewhere like that, and and basically just do some bird watching and, and just turn over a load of ideas while we're at it and um and then plan ahead from that um i think i think we are lucky i mean it, it's a it's a good question because again a lot of the magazines in our group that they really do have a problem with that that you, you're basically repeating the same same content um the photography mags for instance people they know that people buy it for 18 months two years learn what they need to do and then stop buying it so you you got a constant churn of readers and you're effectively just repeating the same same kind of content um in terms of techniques and so on and i think we're lucky but just birding as a as a subject that there's always something changing you know um just in in the time that i've been at the mag you know in terms of what birds you know some birds becoming much more common some going into the decline that kind of thing there's just a, a, a lot more fresh content there for us to pick up on really so um so i think we take our lead from that a lot you know uh, um again uh, myself and mike whedon we're, we're both mad keen birders the, the other two guys the, the mag they're, they're kind of garden birders um but we all sort of you know when, when we're, we're in the office we haven't been there for three months or whatever, but, um, you know, people are constantly saying, oh, you know, I noticed such and such the, the other day. And, and sometimes, you know, that's just a little germ of an idea that turns into a feature then. Um, um, so it, it is kind of led by the birds themselves, I suppose. It's... Yeah. Chris was asking, do most of your readers um, get pr the printed version or digital editions? Is there, is there a switch? from prints to digital? Um, certainly most get the print. Um, we, we, we've kind of pushed the digital edition, all the mags in the group are doing, but um, most of our digital sales are people who have a, a digital and print subscription. So I think you, you pay slightly more than the print um, and, and you get both basically. You, um, what, how does the, the digital version differ? Um, more and more we're adding sort of extra photo galleries and video and that kind of stuff where we can. Um, and we've got the, we've got the, um, 
the staff and the technology to do that much more easily now. So hopefully that's going to just keep growing. Um, but a lot, you know, most people still like to have a, a print print edition in the hand, and, and um, that's good. You know, we 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 won't want that to change really. Um, so. It's like books, yeah. really. You know, people said, yeah. you know, Kindles, uh, e ebooks, they're the ones, that's the thing, thing for the future. But I think nothing beats the visceral feel of a book or a magazine. No. And um, I think old habits die hard. But then that then brings me on to the subjects when I say old habits and old, the word old. The readership you have, um, what's, what's it like in terms of, well, what is it like, firstly? And then, how are you doing in attracting a younger audience to 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 the magazine um so it, it's uh i think i think in the last survey we did i think it's probably about 60 to 65 percent male and it does tend to be people 50 and over um that they tend to make up the biggest biggest group of our readership but we have been you know, probably over the last ten years, we've been getting more and more female readers and more younger readers, which, which is great. And and the two things we want to build on. And um, I think part of that is uh, that a, a lot of younger birders nowadays seem to be. Uh, for one thing, they're into photography a lot of them, and for another, they seem to be uh, much more all-round naturalists than and older birders now i mean i i you know until 10 years ago I, I knew nothing about anything other than birds really and I, i've gradually picked up a bit about dragonflies and butterflies and so on um whereas younger birders seem to be, take a much more all round view of it and um again from our point of view that's great because it gives us more scope for content you know um and not necessarily features totally about non-birding subjects but you can bring them into features and, and um so hopefully it's a two-way thing that that is then bringing in younger readers as we go so the birding world as we know is well, actually maybe we don't know what's it like now i know predominantly in the past it was male yeah for me i'm seeing more women in england in britain birding yeah uh, would you agree with that and secondly how has that been reflected in the magazine? Are you are you getting more women writing pieces, and uh, are women actually kind of are you approaching women in terms of getting them to write? And are people saying yes, or are they shying away, feeling that they're not able to do so? Um, we're certainly getting more women approaching us with, with features, and and hopefully we're, we're featuring more. Um, but I think there is still definitely a shyness about it, and and. Uh, a tendency to um yeah well uh, as you say i suppose just to shy away a bit and one of the things I, I noticed as soon as i became editor and you get, go out to do talks to rspb groups or, or local bird groups and um not only were there more women there than i expected but they're, they're very often the ones taking a very active role in the group and and uh, the ones who make everything happen and yet that as you say that didn't seem to be reflected and it wasn't reflected in the magazine i'm sure um and, and it wasn't necessarily reflected in the birdies you saw out in the field and I, I think that is changing i certainly see more women out birding now and um and more women photographers as well and i've been out this afternoon um just to a local a little local reserve and and all the birders i saw were women today which was uh, you know, 10 years ago, I don't think that would have been the case. Um, so, yeah, we're, we're getting more submissions from women, um, but we'd always like more, really. Um, and I think possibly one thing I, I would change is that we've had some great stuff from women writing about the experience of women in bird watching. But what we're trying to get over is that we want them to write about anything, you know. Um, and one of the, the most popular parts of the magazine, Ruth Miller's column, she, she does a, a, a two page spread every month. And it's really just Ruth writing as 
a mad keen bird watcher um and and that's all there is to it and, and people love it you know it, it's it's one of the parts of the mag that we always get letters about we always get people um wanting us to pass stuff on to ruth so um i think that's kind of a model for for what we want really that that it, it doesn't have to be um doesn't have to be about birding as a woman it, it's just we want to hear from more women who go birding really so do you think a lot of the women that actually shy away is it because they kind of think to themselves it's a bit of a man's world and i guess looking back in the history not just with bird watching magazine but with other publications yeah a lion's share of the the articles and whatever you are written by men yeah i think so definitely and and it um it is difficult you know it, it's it's difficult if if we were to try and do 50 50 split in our contributors it would be quite difficult at the moment and um, because we, we we don't get uh we don't get enough women who, who want to write regularly um for one thing you know ruth does we, we used to have kate risley wrote a regular piece which again was really popular but um when kate had kids she she, she wanted to knock that on there for a bit um so yeah you know it, it, it'd be good to have more regular female contributors definitely yeah and how would you go about that i mean claire's just asked the question do you have like a talent do you, do you hunt for new talent um, or you wait for them to approach you? I would imagine hunting for talent is going to be hard because you're going to have to find where they've written something, I suppose. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think it is changing a bit. Um, Stephen Moss, I don't, I don't know whether you know, he, he runs a, um, a nature writing course at Bath Spa University, I think now. And, and Stephen's been really good at sort of pointing people in our direction and... and um, uh, I've got two or three features for the rest of the year lined up from from students of his, and uh, I think they're all female. Um, so, so there's a bit of sort of talent scouting going on like that. And it, occasionally in the past, we've had people, you know, say oh, you should get so and so to write. And there's a guy called Ben McDonald, uh, if you remember. Uh, uh, um, yeah, I can't try to think who who sort of. Um, put us on to him but somebody said oh, you, you just got to get him to write something for you so um we are getting that more and more and, and, and we're certainly getting it with female writers so that, that's encouraging i think it's yeah well the hot topic at the moment um obviously is diversity um and it'd be interesting to get your view oblique the magazine's view on that um I'll give you my view firstly. I mean, I've obviously been birding all my life. I'm a black guy and I've never seen anyone else. I can't think I very few people of color writing for any magazine unless they come from another country, of course, you know, yeah. like, not from Africa or even the U S. Well, firstly, what do you think? I mean, how, how can people be attracted to write about their hobby or about birds. Um, and as you said, not so much about being black or Asian in birding, but more about the subject itself. How, how do you do that? Um, I, think, I think one of the ways is, is getting over to people, um, a, a bit of what I was talking about earlier, really, that we're, we're interested in all kinds of birding for one thing. That, um, it, it always strikes us at, at bird fair you talk to people and that they kind of see birding as um very much that old-fashioned you know qu quite sort of male-dominated thing and, and the, 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 think of the twitching aspect of it and listing and all the rest of that and um you know the reality is that that's not that's not what a lot of birders do you know um and so, so we, we, we try to push the, the garden birding aspect and, and birding close to home um, and urban birding as well. You know, it, it, something, obviously you, you've done that for us and, and it, it, it's, it's taken on a, um, it's become a much bigger part of what we cover, I guess. That, um, and hopefully that opens it up to, to more people, you know, because um, I think, 
the whole sort of traditional bird watching thing it, it, it is very much the kind of thing that um there's a reason why it's dominated by sort of 50 something men because they, they got the time and money and um chance to do it a lot of the time and um there's a lot of birders who haven't necessarily so widening the subject pool i would hope um widens the uh the people who will write for us and people who read us as well so yeah one more question on that subject again it's it's a, it's a question that's been banded around quite a lot do you, i mean obviously you got birding a lot you may not necessarily be able to see it but do you ever perceive racism um amongst birders do you ever sort of come across people talking about other sets of people in a, a derogatory way uh do you ever actually see any kind of in your face racism at all um i don't think i have sort of in person um I, i've seen quite a lot of it online definitely on bird forums and that kind of thing and uh you know it it, it gets called out a lot more than it used to uh, you, you see people get away with it a lot more um i don't think i've seen it in person so much i, I you know until recently I, I i've lived near leicester most of my life and um you you wouldn't say there's a lot of ethnic minority birders but but you do see some um and leicester obviously it's got a big asian population you know so um so i don't know whether it's entirely typical really um but I've, ne I've never seen anything in the field particularly. Um, it, but online, uh, as with a lot of things, people think they can get away with that online, I guess. So. Yeah, they, got, they, they become very emboldened. Yeah. And I, yeah. In, in all my life of birding, I very rarely, very rarely came across anything. Most of yeah. the times I've been racially abused has been way outside of the nature sector. It's, you know, I've always felt as if I was um, within a sheltered area. And yeah. This, this is way before I was known as a young bird. This is me as a kid, you know, young adult, going to yeah. far-flung far places like going to Silly Isles with my mates or whatever. Um, yeah. I was never, you know, I was always made to feel welcome. So yeah, yeah. I find that quite interesting. I'd like to, um, to explore that more, and we'll be doing that during the week when I speak with um, Caroline Lucas MP. Yeah. Um, Chris has asked a question here. Do you think digital ID apps will help more people or help to get more people involved uh, mm. and make it easier? Or new products like the Swarovski binoculars that can take pictures and Bluetooth to phones to ID birds? Yeah. Um, I, I have to say, uh, the, 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 the ID app I'm thinking of then, Merlin, the American one, and when I first used it, I thought this is great, and, you know, and, and you could see that it would help open birding up. Uh, the the more I've used it, or, uh, every now and then I give it a little try just to see it, and I, I kind of feel like it's become less accurate as it's gone on. And I wonder if that's because um, people you, you go through the process, and then it asks you asks you, was this the bird you saw? So you kind of um, you could be saying yes the wrong answer and that feeds back into the app and makes it so i don't know whether there's some fine tuning's got to go on there i think in theory it's a brilliant idea and, and uh you know using that with the Swarovski, um whatever they call it I, um i haven't had a chance to try one yet um yeah using them together i, I think that that's a great way of opening it up and, and you can see how it worked brilliantly with groups um you know school groups and stuff like that um, Do you think it'll make people lazy though? I mean, surely, you know, if, you, if I had a pair of binoculars when I was beginning and I knew but if I looked at something, it would tell me what it is, would that make me lazy to not sort of try and work it out for myself? Yeah, I think that there's definitely a risk of that. And um, that's, that's to say, I, I think they've, they've got to do the verification process. They've got, they've got to uh, tweak that somehow because at the moment, you don't have to have that base of knowledge to necessarily you could you could pick that app up and, and be feeding all kinds of stuff into it really um and i think yeah you know that there's there's not really any substitute for the old-fashioned way of learning it and you, you know I mean, you don't have to pick up the collins guide and, and learn it back to front you just sort of do it bit by bit um 
what's in your garden and, and so on. And, and um, you know, that, that there's always going to be, there's always going to be some birds that you, you struggle with. I mean, I, I, you know, I, I don't know what you're like, but gulls are just, I, I, I mean, gulls, larks, warblers, pipits, but they're the ones that actually interest me the most because they're a challenge, but you know, yeah. sometimes they're tough. And I think there's this thing now in life where society, where people want things in digestible chunks now, and yeah. they want an answer for everything now. And it's difficult sometimes to say to people, actually, sometimes you've got to let things go. You know, yeah. you just can't ID it. And even yeah. experts don't know, not everyone knows everything. And I think, you know, that's the problem. I think people are trying to learn or trying to not learn, actually trying to cut, cut corners. Yeah. Uh, and I've noticed that when I'm out birding, uh, there's people who are really mad keen twitchers and, but they don't really know what they're looking at sometimes. Yeah. And I actually see that in other fields, like for example, football. I sit and watch football, well, I used to anyway, when I was in England, and, and people around me would be commenting on the game. And some people can really read the game and understand what's going on. They can see yeah. what, someone was, you know, what, what someone was thinking when they did whatever they did. Where other people, whereas other people, they, they seem to not advance beyond a certain point. They never will ever see the nuances or never get yeah. to that point. And that's not a negative thing. I think it's probably how your brain's wired. I mean, some people, back to birding, some people I know, um, they just will refuse to look at gulls. I'm not going to yeah. bother looking at a gull because it's no point. I'm not, I'm, I'm not interested. Um, so I think there's different kind of layers within birding, but within birding as, a, as there isn't anything in life, really. Yeah, yeah. You know, there's some people that are so, totally mad keen and have to know everything. And there's others who just, you know, are happy just to recognise a robin and blue tit in their back garden. And I think both are fine. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, personally, uh, I was saying to you earlier, I went out earlier and saw willow tit, which, you know, is a, a difficult bird to see around here. And um, part of the pleasure of it was kind of going through my little checklist of things in my mind, you know, to separate it from marsh tit. And, and for me, that's part of the pleasure of bird watching. It is a bit of a, a puzzle and, a um, you know, a mental exercise, I suppose. Um, but I guess it doesn't have to be for everybody. You know, it, it, it's what, what you get pleasure from. Exactly. It'd be interesting to know what you Zoomers think of this subject, actually, what makes a birder, because so often people are almost chastised for not knowing something or not su supposedly knowing something. Um, I've noticed, for example, when I'm birding um, now as the urban birder, I go somewhere and people expect you to know everything. And often, um, I remember once um, someone put up a picture on, on Facebook and it was a, a, a black-headed, uh, it was a lesser black back or great black back, I can't remember which one it was. And I, I said what, what I thought it was and it was wrong. It was actually the other. Yeah. And it's almost like, six or seven months later, I was speaking to some random guy and the first thing he said to me was, lesser black black girl. <laughs> and I said, and? He said, uh, you got it wrong, remember you? And I said, great. I said, the more mistakes you make, the better you become. Yeah, yeah, exactly, yeah. And, and that's the, that is a problem sometimes in birding. People are made to feel that you need to see X amount of birds per, you know, by a certain time. And the more birds you see means you're a better birder which I think is absolutely rubbish. You know, I've traveled the yeah. world several times over in the last 15, 16 years. My list by rights should be phenomenal, but instead it's not. And the reason why it's not phenomenal is I'm not interested in just ticking off to show other people, look, I've seen, you know, 5,000, 6,000, 7,000 species of birds. Yeah. I'm more no. interested in knowing that I've seen something and I can remember seeing it. Yeah. And I've had an experience with it. Yeah. Um, no, I, I was going to say one of the things we, we, we run um, read up holidays in, in Scotland, um, you know, several times a year um, and run some ourselves and then we do others with Heather Lee. And one of the things we always say to people is um, with golden eagles, you know, if you see something you think is a golden eagle, shout it out. And it doesn't matter if the first 50 that we see are buzzards. That nobody's going to 
care if they see 50, 50 buzzards that have been called as golden eagles if we get that one goldie at the end of it, you know. Uh, and, and it's as you say, that, that's how you learn anyway. That, that's, you, you make some mistakes and you... Yeah, uh, but too often people are made to feel, you know, bad for it. Chris here has said yeah. he's been birding for two years and do feel intimidated if in the hide. Chris, is it possible to talk to us? Can, are you, uh, you're not shy, are you? No, I'm here. <laughs> Hi. So tell us about your experiences as, as being a, a new birder, because you've been birding for the last two years. Yeah, um, I found, well, I started off really um, photography-wise, going to um, local nature reserve and, uh, with my partner. And then from there, I think just gradually got into more into the bird watching side. So really now it's what round the photography sides a lot less. We've got a spot and scope, etc. We've got a lot of different books to reference, etc. But I found the um a, uh, the local wildlife trust um reserve um they do some quite good probably like once a quarter um do different types of courses like beginner's guide to bird watching. I found those the best way to start. So I could probably say, um, you know, I can certainly notice the difference from like a year ago, just the amount of things I could spot, like doing the same course last year and this year. I can say, you know, I can recognise like a lot more ducks or turns or, you know, different things like that. So, yeah. But um, yes, sometimes I think if you go out into the, um, certain hides, I think that I don't know if it's just me that you do feel that sort of, um, yeah, you see like, like a lot of, I don't know, guys who are 50, 60, whatever, maybe it's a bit older, who seem to know everything. So it makes you just like keep, uh, keep your mouth shut. Yeah, but sometimes, sometimes, Chris, you know, I, I've noticed that as well. And sometimes pe the people that talk the loudest often are the ones that know the least. Um, mm. And they should be the ones that should be helping other people. And I've been in heights where, you know, people have been shouting off, whatever, and they're getting it wrong themselves. I remember being in Raynham once, and there was a serin, um, well, there was a serin in the area, and one of the older guys was looking for his scope from the cafe and said, oh, I've got it. So I went over to him and looked through his telescope, and there was a linnet. And I said, oh, is it still there? And he looked, said, yep, it's there. I said, but... It's got white on its wing. It's a serin. I said, yeah, but he said, it's a serin. So you wouldn't have it, <laughs> you know. Um, but I, I, I totally get you, Chris, sometimes. And I think um, you just have, to, just have to try and find people who can really help you and guide you. Because um, that's what it's, this is about. And I, I, I can never get this. I never understood this elite business going on in, no. you know, in our hobby. Because it doesn't help anyone. This, it, you know, once those people die, who, who's left to, to come back? Uh, behind them, should I say? Who's, who's left behind them? You've got yeah. people. I think it's just trying to get, like, the, the demographic down a bit, you know, sort of, you know, get it down into the, you know, I'm, like, 48, and it's getting it down to, you know, sort of down into the, you know, that age, 30s, that type of thing. But I found the, the, the most sort of approachable people are sometimes I, um, I go to an RSPB uh, reserve down at Salt Home. I right, think right, I've right. been there, David, and um, the volunteers there are um, really good, like really helpful. And they'll, you know, I think there's a long year dowel there just around the start of the year. And, uh, you know, they sort of took us down there and pointed it out. And, you know, like, I got, like, a lot from that. Yeah. So I think that's, like, the, you know, that's the best way, I yeah. think, to, like, learn. Yeah, absolutely. That's really good. I mean, for me, I'm sorry to jump in again, Matthew, but for me, I think it's so, it's so important to help other people. And I, I just hate yeah. it. You got people who are so narrow-minded. I remember being in a, in a in a reserve once and asking someone, "Oh, do you get bitten here?" Oh, you never get bitten here. As if this, well, how dare you ask that question? And as he said, "You never get bitten here." One jumped up out of the reeds. Yeah, you know. Um, 
So it's about keeping an open mind. It's about being positive. It's about helping people. Just help each other. Yeah, absolutely. I think if I had one bit of advice for a beginner, it would be that, that keep an open mind. And I can remember as a kid, um, the field guards I had, and I had an RSPB one, but I had a Reader's Digest one. It's a really nice field guard. Dim Wallace did, the, did a lot of it, I think. Um, but I would read stuff in there and it would say not fat, you know, where a bird was found, not found in, and I just took that as gospel and I thought you're never going to see. And I think a lot of beginners do that. And, and in fact, that's the great thing about bird and, you know, things pop up all over the place when, when you least expect them. And, um, you know, if you, if you bear that in mind, you, you certainly enjoy your birding more, but you'll see more birds as well. Yeah, I mean, I always say when I give my talks, you know, go, you go to a new reserve, they give you a list of the birds you've seen to be seen there. You look at the list, you respect it. When the yeah. person's gone, you scrunch it up, throw over your shoulder, nice little back heel into the bin, yeah. there, style, start, with a bit of style, and then keep your mind open because anything yeah. can turn up anywhere at any time. Um, Shailesh has said that uh, in the hide, uh, for me, I'm in the hide and see, for example, a bit in, I'll be happy to show it to a birder, doesn't matter what age or sex you are. Claire volunteers at an RSPB reserves in hides and helps to show everyone, even the regular obvious species, which is very important. And families love that, especially summer winter maps. Oh, you're talking about the, um, the, the, the fact that birds don't occur in certain places because you look at the map and it says winter or summer, but things can be found, you know. I mean, it's a rough guide, isn't it? A guide yeah, yeah. Is, is what it is. It's a guide. Yeah. And, and, and bird guides are inevitably out of date you know that, that population maps and that kind of stuff that they're, they're based on 10 year old data always so um you know you have to bear that in mind and uh. yeah all right so listen we're approaching the first the first hour the the hour because <laughs> we could talk all night um i'd like to ask you matt um whilst you're sitting there and by the way mm -hmm. uh, matt looks very different to the photograph on <laughs> I actually think the beard look, makes you look a bit, a bit suave. I can imagine you in a pinstripe suit and a, and a, and a, a, a tie and a pair of binoculars around your neck. Um, but anyway, um, what is your favourite bird, Matt? Okay, so my, I think my favourite bird is curly, probably. Um, just because it's, it's such an evocative song and call. Um, and as I said earlier, we, we used to get and breed really close to home here and i think they probably still do but they're quite hard to find um so yeah i think that's my favorite bird if it, uh, worldwide i'm not sure but but certainly my favorite british bird it's funny because i was at the weekend um dawn to dusk in birding uh to get my year list ducks i'm doing a year list in extra madura now sixth but anyway, um, one of the birds that we found were two curlews, um, which were totally unseasonal. Again, mm. if you look at field guide, you'd be thinking, oh, they're not supposed to be here. Um, but two curlews, which was really good because they normally are spring migrants uh, through extra Majuna. So I was really happy to get them on my list. Um, yeah. Talking about mammals now, um, have you got a favourite mammal? Uh, I have, yeah. A, a big wolf, I think. I've only seen wolves once. So, um yeah, I, I'd always wanted to, and I'd love to see him again. So, uh, and that that was in Israel, actually, which I would never have expected you get get wolves there. But, um, uh, yeah, that's I, I, I've not kind of done much of Scandinavia. I've, uh, I've only been briefly to Norway. So, um, you know, I think Estonia and and Finland and Sweden. You know, you'd have a good chance of seeing them, but. Um, yeah, that's my favourite mammal. Good. And notwithstanding the pandemic at the moment, where would you be right now if uh, if you could be somewhere? Um, in the world. Anywhere in the world. Oh, um, I think probably Ecuador would be. Uh, you know, I've been very lucky with a magazine to get to travel to some places, and and um, yeah, I think Ecuador. Uh, I've been once, and I'd love to go again. I've never, I've never been there at all, actually. Um, so I'll have to go as well. Um, okay, um, before we wrap up this hour, let me just tell you, Zoomers, what's going on. Uh, 
uh, for the next couple of days. Tomorrow we've got Edward Mayer, um, who um, set up um, Save Our Swift, Swift, Cons Swift Conservation, and he'll be talking about Swift Conservation tomorrow, and he's a very enigmatic man, so you've got to tune in for that. Wednesday we've got uh, Caroline Lucas MP, and she'll be asking me questions, but I'll be asking her questions as well. And um, we'll be talking about diver diversity as well as our relationship with nature during the coronavirus pandemic, uh, as well as um, other issues to do with her party and their view on nature and conservation. On Thursday, Thursday afternoon at three o'clock, so mark that in your diaries, three o'clock um, in the afternoon, we've got Silas Olofsson. Um, he's a really interesting birder who's from the Faroe Islands. Um, takes really great pictures. He's what well, well, he's probably the best bird on the Faroe Islands, but there's only five. But he's really good. Um, I went with him actually to the Faroe Islands birding, and we spent five days together. And it was the, some of the hardest birding I've ever done in my life, because after you've seen rock pipits, um, wren, uh, rock dove, um, house sparrow, and um, maybe herring gull or what have you, that's it. So we were searching the front gardens of these one horse towns. And for every 200 bushes you find, you might find one chip chaff. It was almost soul destroying. The only thing that kept you going was the fact that the next bird could be an incredibly amazing bird. Yeah. That, that particular week, you know, I was, I was suicidal at one point but we still managed to find uh, the second ever record of Bonaparte skull. And we also found white, the American white wing scoter as well. And that just shows you how rich that area is. But anyway, we're going to be talking not about the Faroe Islands, but about birds of Mongolia. Um, he's been out in Mongolia for the last year or so with his family, and he's been taking pictures and finding some of the firsts and seconds from, the Mon from, from Mongolia. He's a really brilliant bird, and it'd be interesting to watch because... He's got quite an interesting technique of birding, which I, you know, I want to talk to him about. On Friday, it's not on the list yet, but on Friday we should be having Nick Baker here um, talking about insects because it's National Insect Week. And then next week we have a few more people um, to be signed up and committed, in, not to uh, an asylum, but committed on this, uh, which includes um, this lady called Polly Morgan, who is an artist who uses birds stuffed birds that she stuffs, stuffs herself and she she finds dead birds basically and stuffs them and uses them uses them uses them in this really interesting way in a very dark art um so hopefully that'll be a really interesting one to to tune in for so we've got more people coming so keep an eye on the website um at this point i want to say also thank you to our sponsors um which are um or who are even Leica, Leica uh, birds and nature Leica optics and also um, King's Place uh, Music Foundation, um, who are sponsoring this as part of their Nature Unwrapped series. Um, so thank you, you guys, for allowing this to happen. Matt, you've been incredible. It's pretty nice. To, I mean, Matt is a lovely man, as you can tell. I, I love spending time with him. He looks pretty cool now with his beard. All good. <laughs> so thank you very much, Matt, for coming along. Pleasure. Thank you, David. Yeah. Thank you, everybody else. Yeah, Zoomers, thank you. Um, so tune in next week or actually this week for more um and also the new thing is please if you're going to book anything book an hour before at the very latest because um we've had to move it to not from half an hour to an hour because too many people are booking in the very last minute so one hour before if you don't mind um so take care everyone and don't forget to keep looking up